Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this live conversation on the right to freedom of association and the registration of NGOs advanced LGBTQI plus rights in Africa. My name is Melissa Lumina, Legal and Communications Associate Officer for the International Commission of Jurists Africa Team. I'm excited to be joined by my regional director, Kajo Ramjeth and Keo, who will be moderating this conversation. So today we are joined by five incredible human rights advocates who will be sharing their insights on progress made towards realizing the right to freedom of association for those advancing the human rights of members of the LGBTQI plus community. I'll give them all an opportunity to introduce themselves in a little bit, but first I'll just provide a bit of background to our discussion today. So African courts in countries such as Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Kenya, for example, have affirmed the rights of, LG of members of LGBTQI plus organizations to advocate for their human rights. And a number of countries have also made several strides on affirming LGBTQI plus rights further, and a few have decriminalized consensual same-sex relations in recent years, such as the Seychelles, Gabon, Botswana, to name a few. However, there are still many obstacles to be able to, be able to advance LGBTQI plus rights on the continent, a number of these organizations have faced many obstacles in being able to register with the appropriate authorities in their countries to operate legally. The Kenya Supreme Court's recent ruling on the registration of the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission represents more progress made in this area. So this development and other pending cases on LGBTQI plus rights issues in Namibia, Malawi, Eswatini and others inspired the topic of conversation for today. One of the most recent developments, a rather distressing one in the area of LGBTQI plus rights advocacy on the continent came in the form of the Ugandan parliament passing an ultra draconian law called the Anti-Homosexuality Act, which will effectively trample the rights of members of the LGBTQI plus community in Uganda, including for merely advocating for them. So this conversation today will explore the gains made in LGBTQI plus rights advocacy on the continent, the legal and other stumbling blocks preventing registration of LGBT rights NGOs on the continent, strategies that they could employ to challenge discriminatory laws and blocks to registration, as well as any further work that needs to still be done in the area of human rights advocacy for LGBTQI plus persons on the continent, and the work that needs to be done to ensure that these organizations can operate safely and effectively advocate these rights. So I'll now hand over to the speakers to do a brief round of introductions. I think we can start with, uh, with you, Kajal, and then we can go to Adrian. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Kajal Ramjathan Keo. I am um, ICJ Director for the Africa Program. ICJ has a robust program focusing on SOGI rights in Southern and East Africa. And this um, webinar this afternoon is part of that program. I'm delighted to be joining you today. And we have a very eminent um, panel of experts on this issue, <clears throat> who will explain to us the situation in the individual countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Adrian Giuco, and I work for Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum. I'm the executive director. Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum works for the protection of LGBT persons, legal protection. So we do legal service provision, we do legal research, we do legal advocacy, all around, around, uh, around the law. So I'm glad to be here and I'll be speaking about the situation back home in Uganda. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Bradley? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bradley Fortain, and I am with the Southern Africa Litigation Center uh, as the, the LGBTIQ program officer. Uh, based in Botswana. Um, so we do a lot of work with communities um, in the Southern African region, um, and not just focusing on LGBTIQ rights, but a wide um, array of, 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 of rights uh, within the region. A lot of work that we also do is with uh, grassroots organizations, um, through advocacy, helping communities with strategic litigation and so forth. Thank you. Uh, Pumlani, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, uh, hello, everyone. So uh, glad to be part of this um, esteemed uh, webinar. My name is Pumlani Damini. I am the legal advisor in the Commission on Human Rights and Public Administration um, of the Kingdom of Eswatini. 
and uh, also I do lead investigations on any human rights uh, uh, complaints or violations complaints which are which come through to the commission. I'm glad to say that um, one of those complaints um, in 2020 came from uh, an organization called um, Eswatini Sexual and Gender Minorities, which had been um, refused registration by the Registrar of Companies as an NGO. And we worked around that. We um, investigated their complaints and compiled a report. And I think that these are some of the issues that I'm going to share now. And the, the, that matter is still before courts with our report. But I think that we will um, get into that issue and maybe we discuss what we are, we are about to discuss today. Thank you. Moretta, you're muted, I think. Eric, I think she's inviting you to introduce yourself. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I am Eric Sambisa, um, the Executive Director of an organization called Nyasa Rainbow Alliance. Uh, Nyasa Rainbow Alliance is an organization that seeks to advance the lives of LGBTI people in Malawi. It was founded in 2014, so, and also he's still struggling to get registered. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I think we are still waiting for Eric Gitari to join us, um, but we'll just proceed with the conversation and I'm sure he'll be able to join us um, when he is, is able to. But yeah, thank you so much for the introductions. I'll just do a little bit of um, just brief um, housekeeping. So essentially the conversation will revolve around our esteemed panelists. Kajo will just ask them a series of questions and we will have them make their interventions. And then at the end, we will allocate a bit of time to Q&A, as well as responses to the interventions and final remarks from all of our speakers. Otherwise, I think that that is it. And I think that we can now proceed. Kajol, please take it away. Thank you so much. There appears to be a growing agitation against the rights of LGBTIQ plus individuals in multiple countries, particularly in East Africa. Police arrested 24 people in Burundi as they attended a seminar organized by an HIV AIDS charity in February. <clears throat> they were all charged with homosexual practices and incitement to homosexual practices. Burundi's president recently said, called on his fellow citizens to curse those who indulge in homosexuality because God cannot bear it. <clears throat> The anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda, which we will hear about in some detail during the course of this discussion, and which is actually a revised version of legislation which was struck down in 2014, and it sought to punish same-sex relations with life imprisonment as the sanction, has now been revived and is expected to be given assent by the Ugandan president in the coming days. The bill targets the promotion of homosexuality as well as non-binary gender identities. It is truly unconscionable that we are facing such bigotry, prejudice and discrimination now in 2023. Media are reporting that anti-LGBTIQ plus sentiment is deeply entrenched in the highly conservative and religious religious East African countries, with same-sex relations punishable in some cases by life imprisonment. More than 30 African countries ban same-sex relations, but Uganda's law, if it is passed, would, be, would appear to be the first to criminalize merely identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And queer. <clears throat> The proposed Ugandan law was introduced as a private member's bill and aims to allow the country to fight threats to the traditional and heterosexual family. Meanwhile, Anglican bishops in Southern Africa have failed to reach agreement on blessing same-sex unions during church services, ruling out church marriages for same-sex couples, However, the bishops have resolved to craft special prayers 
suitable for providing pastoral care to couples in same-sex civil unions. This does not appear to be a happy medium to, to have for, 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 for same-sex couples who wish to have same-sex unions and marriages. Um, and so there is much work that needs to be done in promoting equality across Southern Africa and East Africa. And we're here this afternoon to discuss some of the challenges and some of the progressive steps which we are seeing in these countries. I'm going to start off the discussion this afternoon um, with Adrian Juko from Uganda. Adrian, the passing of the anti-homosexuality bill by the Ugandan parliament sparked international outcry and condemnation. Rightly so. Please explain to us why this is so. And also, has this attention helped LGBTIQ plus rights in the country at all? And if so, can you give us a bit more detail about that? Thanks so much, Kajau. And um, I'm glad to be here and to be speaking about this. It's um, quite an uneasy moment for us back home in Uganda uh, because of the implications and what this means for us uh, as a country, as LGBT activists, and where the future, where the future lies. Of course, when I saw one of the themes of this seminar, of this webinar being registration of organizations, I'm like, okay, this is almost the exact opposite of what's going on back home because now registration is proving to be a complete difficulty in light of the law which criminalizes um, running an organization that promotes homosexuality. Now, the question of promoting homosexuality, I think is one of the biggest provisions in here. Of course, there's the provision on homosexuality itself, which is special by life imprisonment. Uh, homosexuality now is an offense, like being, being homosexual is supposed to be a criminal offense if the president signs this bill into law. What this means is a number of things. Mainly the law now as it is written is focused on the sexual act, yes. But the social act is defined in such a way that the other language of unnatural offenses that we know in the old British law has now gone. And now it's clear that if you have sexual relations of any kind with a person of the same sex, that is regarded as homosexuality and punished by life imprisonment. That's the big departure from what we had before, where we could say unnatural offenses, the language is not clear, blah, blah, what they're criminalizing nowadays. Now it's, it will be very clear if this becomes law. The second provision is that on aggravated homosexuality, which basically is being a repeat offender. If like you have homosexuality more than once, which is, which is interesting, which means that almost everyone who will be caught up with this, that is aggravated homosexuality, punishable by the death penalty, you see? And that is quite problematic in that, in that respect, because Uganda, the death penalty has not been um, applied here, I think, for the past, at least the, no one has been executed for the past more than 20 years in Uganda. However, we don't know how this is going to go because of all the politicization that's going around the LGBT issue. I'm sure someone will be made an example um, very soon. Another interesting provision is learn on reporting that every person, not just before it was persons in authority, now it's every person has the obligation to report if you get to know someone who is gay, or if you suspect, if you get to know someone is about to commit homosexuality, right? Or someone has committed homosexuality is supposed to report. And this would imply that parents, doctors, um, uh, counselors, persons on the street, neighbors, landlords, every single person is supposed to report you because you are gay or because they suspect that you are gay. This is a very dangerous provision, a provision which even applies to lawyers. So there's, a, there's this argument that, you know what, the provision doesn't apply to lawyers because it says this provision shall not apply to advocates. Now, I'm an advocate of the High Court of Uganda. I implying that the law may not apply to me, but there are no advocates who work largely without lawyers, lawyers who have not yet taken the back course, lawyers who are not advocates, so still, this would still apply to them. Paralegals whom we work with in your law firm, would still, this provision would still apply to them. So that means that if as an advocate, I get a case, I'm supposed to handle it without any lawyers touching it, without any um, para paralegals touching it, without any of my administrative assistants touching the case, because then they will be required to report. Meaning that essentially it becomes completely impossible to run a law firm in light of the circumstances because only the advocate is not supposed to, to report. And if you don't report, this is, a, this is an obligation, this is a criminal offense. So you'll be charged uh, for not reporting. So it also makes every person, every house, every hotel, every room that you occupy as an educated person, it turns it into a brothel. Like 
Uh, if you occupy any rooms, then that room is automatically premises being used for homosexuality. And any person who is running those premises, for example, a hotel owner, for example, a landlord, they are accused, they are guilty, they will be guilty of uh, promotion of homosexuality, which carries a penalty of more than 20 years imprisonment. And that brings me to that provision of promotion of homosexuality, which is where I started. Like this seminar, Kajal would actually be promotion of homosexuality in Uganda. Like speaking about homosexuality, there's something called normalization of homosexuality. Like if you're talking about homosexuality as if it's a normal thing, then we are promoting homosexuality. That is means that the work that I do as a lawyer, as an advocate, is basically criminalized work if that law, if that bill becomes signed into law. We are looking at our work and we're like almost 80% of our work at the moment would basically qualify as promotion of homosexuality. So it's a very worrying provision. And actually, if the bill becomes law, we have to make a decision as organizations on what next in terms of how we are going to live with this law, how we are going to continue our work with this. So all decide that, you know what, we're going to have to stop this work or do it in different ways. Because if you do it, you're going to become a criminal by default. And if an organization commits this offense, the organization pays more than a billion Uganda shillings. I don't know how much that is in US dollars, but it's a hefty sum of money. I've never seen a billion shillings uh, myself. So that means that many organizations won't be able to register, won't be able to continue doing this work. Many of us have already been uh, put on a hit list of over 22 organizations, 26 organizations, 22 of which have not yet been, action has not been taken on them. And Hiraf is on that list. And we're being investigated for promotion of homosexuality. And the result will be closure of this organization. So already, those that are already registered are going to be deregistered, I guess. That's the basic they may give us for promotion. But now we also be committing a criminal offense if you actually go ahead with doing this work. So that's what the bill essentially means for us. And that's why the public outcry, the initial outcry was a lot. Not as much as I would have wanted it to be. I think it's, it's a little bit less than it was in 2014 when a much lighter version of this law was in, was in place. This law is much worse than that that's what we had in, 20, in 2014. The initial outcry hasn't been as much as it was in 2014. Maybe I've been here for so long that I can now compare the two situations. I think it should have been worse. People should have spoken out much more than they have spoken out right now. Because if the president signed this bill into law, then that means essentially LGBT organizing in the country is almost done. That's the truth of the matter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Adrian. I mean, it sounds like a very, very difficult situation in Uganda. Um, if you were to call upon um, activists and civil society organizations in other countries for support, what would you ask them to do? Yeah, that we, we've had these conversations before with uh, within the community and we've been discussing what we should ask our partners to do. At the moment, I think we should speak out as much as possible. Direct our advocacy towards the president, because at this stage, that is what is going to be helpful. Like we speak out and the president doesn't sign. The danger with the president signing and uh, us relying on court would imply that the only avenue we are left with is courts of law. Now, I did. I was part of the team that planned the petition last time, which we won, thank God. But this time around, we are also part of the team that's planning the petition in case this bill comes through. The problem with this time around is the other time we had a very good, a very good um, procedure matter around quorum to bring before the courts. So that bill was struck down in its entirety. This time around, we don't have such a ground which would actually have that bill nullified in its entirety. Meaning, most likely they may nullify a provision or two, but then that essentially means the bill would remain in force the way it was before, and that becomes very dangerous. So at the moment, we'd ask partners to speak out as much as possible, to call upon the Ugandan president to not sign this bill into law, to highlight some of the issues that have not been coming out as much as they should, uh, issues around promotion and what that means, the vagueness of the language, issues around the death penalty, issues around the reporting obligations and no one being able to do any work around uh, LGBT rights, people should highlight the things and speak out as much as possible so that the president doesn't sign this bill into law. If he signs it into law, that will completely be another game altogether. Thanks, Adrian. That's well noted. And um, we, we will encourage all our partners in the region, outside the region, to support um, to support organization and other organizations inside the country, but also um, to request that the president does not sign this bill into law. Okay, so we'll move on to Bradley Fortain from Selk. And um, Bradley, can you explain to us what challenges African NGOs have and encounter when advocating for LGBTQI plus rights, when attempting to register 
and how can these challenges be overcome through strategic litigation? And in particular, if you can talk through the lessons that can be learned and taken away from the Lekha Bibo case, which, um, which was run in Botswana several years ago. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I think like one of the, the challenges that um, LGBTQ NGOs go through when attempting to, to register is still that um, threat of, of, of or, or rather laws that criminalized um, LGBTIQ people. Um, these, and these come to them from colon, uh, colonial laws that have been in place um, to other, to, to, to marginalize, to, to um, make sure that there are groups in, well, certain uh, communities in society that are vulnerable. Um, and uh, uh, often these laws affect um, LGBTQ people, sex workers, um, and just the, the, the mere fact that uh, LGBTQ beings are, are criminalized, um, such laws uh, definitely are used against LGBTQ organizations when attempting to to register. I know um, when when we tried to register La Javibo here um, a few years ago, um, they, they often used um, reasons such as the organization wants to promote homosexuality, um, it's going to, to, to promote un, ungodly issues, you know, <laughs> like that. And that's the backlash that, that, that we get um, from society, from, from, from communities. Um, and the, the increase of laws that suppress, restrict um, organizing of, of, of LGBTIQ organizations are on the rise. Uh, <coughs> <sorry>. <coughs> and we see this a lot happen in, in, in countries such as Botswana, um, Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, and <clears throat> such laws really make it unsafe for, for, for LGBTIQ organizations to register, uh, to exist, um, to, to, to operate, because they put um, um, the community's lives at risk uh, just by such uh, um, com criminalizations. I think, um, at times, going to court um, isn't um, the only route uh, that one can take. Um, and some 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 instances, it can be the last uh, resort. And I think, as organizations, communities, we should at least try to to one at least explore other avenues also, um, so, such as going to to parliament um, to propose. Um, um, bills that can can oh yeah to to to, to enable LGBTQ organizations to 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 register using um, human rights mechanisms such as UPR processes um, and these are platforms that that organizations can use also when attempting to to register court going to court could probably be the the last um, resort. And when talking litigation, um, especially around LGBTIQ organizations, um, if, and this is also if, if one is going to go the litigant route, because um, essentially using La Javibo as an example, um, because the, the, the organization was a community organization. Um, so essentially it's that's what its core was um, um, and how we needed to to start also was do a lot of community empowerment um, to, to to communities um, you know through uh, legal trainings um, and, you know, if it's doing media interviews how do we do that you know um, so it was Im important to to ensure that communities are aware of, of their rights, um, are aware of human rights violations, are aware of the, the situation. Um, if it's being restricted to, to, to register, what does that mean um, in terms of seeking freedom of association? Um, one of the things that, that worked also was partnerships. Uh, we saw that partnerships are very crucial, um, especially with the media, uh, with CSOs, with the church even. 
Um, and this is also what had helped Lahaibo because part of what, and through the, the advocacy that we, we took was taken intersectional approach towards advocacy. Um, and that nice to say on also that LGBTIQ rights aren't um, standalone rights, but it's human rights. Um, so having like a, a solid um, advocacy plan, um, if it's media engagements, um, um, community engagements, how do we go on about this? Um, it was crucial to have language, um, to have wording phrases that was easy for people to to understand, you know, because um, you don't you don't want to 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 go to court and then leave the community behind um, or leave other groups behind, you know. Uh, so it was important to to ensure that everyone is on board um, with if it's what the case is about, um, when are we going to court, uh, you know, and just keeping communities updated also because uh, that also gives um, um, communities a sense of ownership in the case um they're able to 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 speak to the case you know defend it if, if it's talking to 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 the police to 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 the family you know uh about what 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 these cases meant um a lesson learned also that you know and and this is something that we continue to use now also was if the litigants in involved it's ensured to it's important to 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 ensure that litigants um are safe um so if it's uh, physical safety they have access to support uh, psychosocial support and just are aware of the threats also that possibly could come with being a litigant um and that's something that we are also trying to 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 you know, in, in the work that we are doing with with, with SALG also is to, to ensure the safety of, of litigants. Because um, I mean, these are brave people and that, and especially in um, environments that are very hostile towards uh, LGBTIQ people um, are putting their lives out there, are putting their names out there. Um, and what we have also learned uh, from the uh, steps that we had taken uh, th through the the, the the registration was just yes ensuring safety of of litigants um and then i think one thing that that worked uh for 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 Laraibo was being strategic about uh, what names to put on uh, on the litigant uh, 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 case, or if uh, one is the lead applicant, whose name do do we use? Um, there was a lot of backlash uh, back in the days around um, how LGBTIQ is is an un African. Um, you know, we've seen as. Uh, 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 the courts previously also say that the public isn't ready to have such conversations, and also it was um, very um, 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 important to see how are we going to to tackle those uh, um, statements that were made, if it's by the courts uh, before, by the public, by by the media, and having a Sejana name, um, which is one of the local languages here. Uh, as the lead applicant, um, we thought also was like a great strategy, uh, just and especially around about pushing the 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 idea, you know, that LGBTIQ people are Botswana. Um, you know, it's not something that's of a Western import. I think that that worked uh, really well. Um, Strategies, so, social media, you know, social media is a big tool and that is is also how we ensure that the content that we are creating, um, if it's around the case, if it's articles, we put it out there. So you're also owning your own story. You're owning the, the narrative. You're guiding how the conversation is going. Um, and this is also to 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 address negative uh, reports on on LGBTQ um, uh, um, issues, really, I think that that was um, really uh, worked really well. Yeah, um, creating safe spaces, you know, for communities, for litigants, um, even for the organization itself. Um, yeah, I think 
Why not? I'm, I could talk about this the, 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 the whole day really. But I think also a strategy that, that worked was, was using pronouncements from, that were made in court. Um, and if it's a positive ju uh, judgment, using that as part of our advocacy, uh, using that to, to inform the work that we do, uh, you know, um, and for like one of the quotes that I really like uh, from the, the registration case was how the Court of Appeal actually said that LGBTIQ members do form part of the rich diversity, you know, beauty, um, and everything of Botswana and do deserve uh, their rights to be protected, uh, recognized and respected. And that's what we use, uh, you know, to, to do that intersectional advocacy to say human rights are human rights. And this is essentially said by the court. Um, so the court, uh, uh, you know, made these pronouncements. So you can say it's a law, you know, and this is what folks should 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 take off. If so, if it's you know ensuring safe spaces, uh, protections from from for 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 LGBTIQ people, if it's fucking in inclusion, this is stuff that that we can use as 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 part of our work. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Bradley, for that very helpful overview of things that which we can do in court, outside of court around courts and even without accessing courts at all. Thank you so much. So we are going to move to Malawi and um, I'm going to ask <laughs> um, my friend Eric Sambisa, um, who has been trying to register his organization, Nyasa Rainbow Lions, for many years with many challenges. So Eric, if you can please outline for us the particular obstacles and these are the legal, societal, cultural, religious obstacles that have prevented Nyasa Rainbow Alliance from getting registered. And um, can you give us a, an overview of the timeline um, for the process of registration and where things are standing currently? Over to you, Eric. Well, thank you so much, Kaja. It's uh, good to see you again. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, just a little brief background of the case. Uh, uh, the, in, in the, the, as I said, the organization was founded in 2014 after realizing the gaps that the LGBTI community was facing, specifically in the southern region of Malawi. So one of the reasons why uh, the, we wanted to, to form an association was to raise the visibility of the LGBTI community. At that time, there were good, other good other organizations that were doing good work for LGBTI advocacy, but there was uh, a missing gap up around community visibility. So one of the objectives of the organization was to uh, uh, be visible, and that's what we, we stated in our objectives that wanted to be an LGBTI organizations. And that's what made us to uh, be refused to get registered. After being uh, refused to get registered in 2017, the uh, association took the government to court to review its uh, decision because there was no evidence uh, uh, whether if the organization was registered, there was no evidence that they are going, we are going to promote criminal activities. So we took the Minister of Justice to court to review its uh, decisions. That was in 2017. So since 2017 up to now, we've only been given a uh, court audience once. There have been so many challenges that have happened uh, along the way. One of them being um, judges recusing themselves from the case just because it's a sensitive case which is going to attract a lot of public attention. So we've had judges recusing themselves from the case uh, another panel being identified. And we've all had other challenges uh, around uh, 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 funding uh, of the case. Like uh, the courts would say that we don't have funding to uh, conduct hearings. So there are a lot of uh, delay tactics that uh, the, uh, uh, the judiciary has put across. And one of them was funny because at the other time they said uh, we are failing to conduct this hearing uh, just because uh, of sanitary uh, uh, issues, like the, there is no learning water in the court, so the court, the court cannot sit just because of such uh, reasons. 
Yeah, so uh, it's been really a very uh, tough journey uh, since 2017 up to now. Let me just uh, maybe share some of the arguments that we put across uh, to the court when we seek for um, uh, the Minister of Justice uh, to change its redition. In our submission for the, uh, in this case, we stressed that uh, the ability of citizen to associate in a manner recognized by the state and to share opinion is a collective fundamental in our democratic society. Uh, the state being uh, the uh, mother of, uh, of the society, they also have to recognize all voices. That's what uh, uh, the democratic society should look like. We also further said that the state has an obligation to support the exercise of this life, specifically in the case of minority uh, groups. Recently, we've seen the government uh, introducing what was called uh, an inquiry on LGBT life in, forms of, in form of survey. Actually, they commissioned uh, the Malawi Human Life Commission to conduct that survey. So these are some of the issues that we actually uh, credit the government that you cannot uh, subject issues of human life to a study or survey because the outcome is obvious. Uh, since uh, this is the issue of uh, majority. Another uh, a recent development that has happened on the case uh, is about uh, the government refusing to uh, accept some of the recommendation uh, made to it during the previous uh, UPR cycle. As we remember uh, 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 previously, the, our, our governments accepted some of the recommendations made to Malawi, specifically on ending violence for the LGBTI community. But we've seen this government refusing, denying to accept any recommendation uh, that is related to LGBT. This is clear just because our president is coming from a religious background. He's a former pastor himself, and he's trying all tactics to avoid conversations around LGBT. And this is sad seeing Malawi uh, was uh, given a position at Huma Humanized Castle. Uh, it was supposed to lead as an, as an example in respecting human rights according to the international uh, uh, obligations. So the NRA registration case is not, it's just one of uh, another case that is before ca uh, court because we've got other LGBTI uh, related cases that are before court and they are still being denied the chance to be heard. So this is the continuous challenges that we are facing in the country. And we are currently we are, we, we are scared that what has happened in uh, Uganda can also happen in Malawi. Because you know, leaders follow each other. I think they meet somewhere and they discuss how to uh, learn affairs. So the introduction of the NGO bill was also another um, such, uh, uh, criminal sanction that was introduced in the uh, NGO sector. And we don't know at the implementation of this bill, how uh, will the LGBTI organization and other human rights organization, how are they going to be handled by the state? F uh, finally, I just want to, uh, to share with you what some of the interventions that the international community and the people that are watching on the media, what are some of the interventions that they can do to actually assist on the cases, uh, on the cases that are before court uh, that the government is failing uh, to see progress on. Um, we, we will rely on the support of the international community uh, to engage with our government on the progress of NRA registration case and other LGBTI related cases that are stuck before court. The international community should ensure that the Malawi government is implementing and enforcing human rights according to the international human rights standards and should make uh, sure that all protocols signed are fully implemented. The human, uh, the human rights uh, narrative and funding has for a long time been uh, na narrated towards HIV and AIDS. This is very bad just because this promotes stigma and discrimination to an already stigmatized population. We don't have uh, programs or funds that actually talk about human rights 
as, as a whole, but all the funding has been attached to HIV and AIDS. We also would like the international uh, communities to support lawyers and human rights defenders on safety and security when doing advocacy and strategic litigation. And finally, we will rely on the human rights uh, the, the international community to raise awareness on the cases that are stuck in the courthouses, uh, as well as uh, bring out, uh, uh, I mean, facilitate dialogue uh, between the activists and the government. Because I think sometimes it works better when the international community initiate a, a, a dialogue between activists and, uh, and the government. But currently, even if we try so hard to reach out to the government, they don't respond. They've tried all means to refrain themselves from conversations around LGBT. Thank you so much for engaging us. Eric, before you leave us, um, can you give us a quick overview of the other cases dealing with LGBTI rights in, in before the Malawi courts? Thank you so much. So be, apart from the NRI registration case, uh, we are also uh, doing another case together with Southern Africa Litigation Center and other partners. This case was about unlawful arrest of a transgender woman. She was arrested and persecuted for eight years uh, jail sentence based on the same uh, unnatural uh, laws. So we took the, uh, the government to court to, re uh, to review its decision on this case because uh, this transgender woman is now being hosted in the uh, male cell. There are a lot of human rights violations that uh, uh, were conducted during the, uh, uh, when this uh, transgender woman was being uh, uh, handled by the police and all that. So we want the court to interpret uh, the constitutionality of section 153 of the uh, Malawi constitution, because this constitution targets everyone regardless of your sexual orientation or gender identity. So it's another constitutional review case that we are so interested, and if it works well, it can give us a window is a, uh, of opportunity to actually target those laws that criminalizes consensual same-sex uh, activities. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks very much um, for that very clear and interesting overview. And uh, from Malawi, we are going to move to Eswatini. And um, we have Umlani Dlamini from the Eswatini Commission on Human Rights and Public Administration. Um, afternoon, Pumlani. Can you yeah. explain to us the main challenges preventing LGBTQI plus persons and rights organizations in Eswatini, like the Eswatini Sexual and Gender Minority, from registering as NGOs? And what are some of the common justifications given by government for denying this kind of registration? All right. Um, good afternoon, Kajal, and um, much appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate um, the other um, colleagues uh, who have just presented before me. Unfortunately, we started uh, on a rather gloomy picture we just painted by um, Adrienne. It, it, it is really sad to hear that um, it, uh, in Uganda it has gone that, that far and to the extent that um, it has been criminalized, not only criminalized, but um, the sanctions as well to be as steep as this. So um, I, I wonder where we are all headed. I had a chance to listen to the Kenyan parliament yesterday, which was also debating the laws around this. And uh, it seems like they really want to follow in the steps of Uganda because I think only one MP member of parliament um, really spoke on issues of human rights, but otherwise all the other members of parliament were quite of um, um, calling the LGBTIQ plus uh, community devils and all that and um, um, immoral beings and, and so forth. Um, coming back to your questions, um, Kajal, and I hope that uh, maybe since we will be talking about the case which is in court, um, Bradley would also come in handy and assist and, uh, and in trying to see how can we go forward, how can we assist um, in trying to bring to bring our courts to understand 
um, or to, to approach the application before them from a human rights perspective. Uh, the, 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 the Eswatini is, um, yeah, as you might know, I think we are just over a million in the country and we are homogeneous and it is a strongly Christian uh, filled country. And so religion plays a major role towards um, the, the, the opposition on the, or maybe the, the denial of um, some of the, the recognition of the LGBTI, um, LGBTIQ uh, plus uh, community. Um, secondly, we also, most of our politics and also our way of life is so embedded in cultural, uh, in, in culture, so to speak, in to, even in terms of governance system, there has to be culture somewhere there, even in this, making decisions, it is also based on culture. So culturally, I would, I, I, in a nutshell, I would say that um, the tradition, this, the, this traditional barriers which are informed by our culture, and also there is the the, the religious barriers, um, which are informed by the the, the, the fact that uh, Christianity dominates um, in this in in in, in Eswatini, um, such that it is it is I'd say same sex or sexual conduct um, like that of the LGBTIQ is is normally perceived as morally is immoral and also as unswazi in a nutshell. Um, the, the, I would like to pick a few letters from government. Maybe I'd have to say that one other one other impediment is the fact that our law does not prohibit in in any way um, any discrimination against the community, um, and as such, that even our constitution, when it outlines the, those different. Um, basis on, on which it, there, has, there, there has to be prohibition on discrimination. There is nothing which protects um, the LGBTIQ community. And I think that this was conveniently done because it has also been cited in the case before court. Uh, government has made a number of averments um, in, in, in the papers which, was, which were brought before court, which also speaks to, and maybe to a certain extent, I think they they agree with um, my, my 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 view that the it is Christianity and um, um, the the culture and the country that pro, that makes it so difficult to accept the LGBTI community and also to even um, allow them to register. I'll just read from some of the um, um, deposed papers before court. Um, this court, the, the, this, the, 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 the case has gone past the high court where three judges sat and now it is on appeal. So um, this is one minister of um, commerce who is responsible for registering non-governmental organizations, which the ESGM um, sought and made an application to be registered. So the minister went to court in which one can believe this is a government stance. So to answer your question, Kajal, that what normally is the government's justification, we can extrapolate that, that from the, um, from the uh, papers which are before court, because um, it really it shows that this is government stance. One of uh, the reasons put forward, the minister stated that it's an unlawful association as to how there's no explanation, but it's an unlawful. And then he said that if, if, if the, 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 the refusal to register the, the, the organization will be tantamount to legalizing LGBTIQ. So to a certain extent, it would seem that already government has, has been in, in, in whenever in her discussions, um, she looks or she perceives LGBTIQ plus community as an illegal, either illegal ex illegal persons, I'm not really sure, but the, the, um, the, the contention from the minister is that if they can be legitimized, and then to say this would have a drastic impact on the cultural, religious, and social interest. So already those are some of the things now which I, um, he was outlining as those which would be affected if uh, the, 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 the organization were to be registered. Um, he moves on to say that SRT sexual and gender minorities is within confines of the law and it's, a, it, it, it's 
and that its liberty is circumscribed or stopped where it offends common good and public interest of the state and has a duty to protect the morals and traditional values. So again, the government is also raising these two morals and traditions of the country as, as if um, the registration of the, of the organization would have that e e e effect. It would seem that um, from the judgment, which is pretty much like the one which is handed out down by Kenya, but not necessarily on all fours, um, the, the, the rights, because looking at the judgment itself, all the rights are really put out there and they are guaranteed. They, it's only that they're not supposed to form an organization. They're not supposed to be in community and speak in one voice. They're not supposed to, they, they, it, it, oh, should I say that they're right at least for a, a freedom of association somehow in the face of it would be the first one to be um, one which um, can be argued against. But the whole point is that once you are associated, you would seem to be protecting unlawful, immoral, uncultural activities. So that is the most important thing. I mean, the, the most uh, stronger impediments and points which were raised by government. Although I may hasten to say that before the Human Rights Committee and the UPR, um, government had to, would always um, be the first to say that, no, 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 we know that um, we have the LGBTIQ community in our, in our, in our country. We, we, we're not treating them anyhow. We know they are there. They were before the international organization, I mean, um, uh, human rights mechanisms, mostly government would agree that um, she is a way of um, a, the, the, the community, but, as to violence against it, they'll start denying that and they'll say, no, but we give them all the rights, the right to health, the um, right to education, we do not look at that. But as to, as far as protecting them from stigmatization and, and, and ensuring that, and ensuring that they are not discriminated against, there is no, um, there's no zeal, or maybe there's no intention to, 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 to come on that one. But what we hope now is that um, we can look forward and look at the, <clears throat> at the, at the case, which will, will be going to the uh, Supreme Court and see if there's anything that we can do or which together with um, the international community, we can try and, 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 and uh, change the mindset or the, the court's decision at the lower court. It might be important to state that we, we are so close in proximity with South Africa. Um, and I'm sure that um, Bradley as well would agree with me that we, we should be, most of the, the jurisprudence we share is, is, is almost common. And it, be, it is difficult to find from why that as a country um, and with all the jurisdiction coming from South Africa, with all the decisions of the courts in South Africa being persuasive, what happened in that on this one, the, the courts just decided no, we, there's no way we can emulate um, the, 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 the South African jurisprudence. And in those, in, in this judgment itself, there has been, um, a ma there, was ma there was mentioning of um, the, the South African jurisprudence, but the emphasis was that there is nothing in, in, in on the discriminatory, um, Clause in the constitution where even um, sexual orientation is mentioned. It is said that you, no one is supposed to be discriminated either on the basis of race, so forth, so forth, so forth, but there's nothing which mentions um, maybe um, those which would, would support those um, uh, basis which would uh, uh, support the LGBTIQ uh, plus community. So that is the main thing with, and, and with which we know that um, trying to uh, amend the constitution can take quite a long time, but we were hoping, as we as we also outlined in our report, that an exclusion, I mean, an, an omission of mentioning, does not necessarily mean an exclusion. And in most cases, we what we know is that where there has been an omission in law, 
the course should read that law in favor of the person who is disadvantaged. And in this case is the LGBTIQ community. So these are some of the things which I, I hope that we can maybe look at and um, we can also help each other because we are still a little bit behind in um, um, some of, uh, I mean, we are behind, Eric has done quite a, a lot of other work before um, the Malawian courts. There's something that we can get from there together with Bradley so that we can see if there's any assistance we can get. So in uh, what what maybe else, well, another thing that I've noted is that it, it has been, it seems like it's common cause, like I said, that um, it's now a trend. Like I've said that it is more or less the same in Kenya, that the, 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 all the rights will be, will, will be confirmed for the LGBTQI+, but they, 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 it, they would be said, they have all the rights. So, but let, let, it, let them take it into their privacy, the privacy of their homes, not in public. And in that, in that way, stigmatization continues. And in that way, um, the discrimination is, is, is is so um is discrimination is um suffered by them in in isolation whereas once registered that then it would make them better to try and enforce and also realize their different rights which are, are violated we also have learned that you know rights by their nature are divisible you cannot say that you've got that right and not this one uh, they are un unalienable then it, they should be read in in the context of the other rights rather than um looking at just one right that no you've got all the rights but not in not not not, not in public uh, we've got all the rights but you don't need to associate just keep keep them everyone if you ever there's a violation keep it in your room not not outside so um i hope that well in in, in time we will not all be following into the uh, full steps of uganda because that would be really um uh, bad for not only the countries but the continent uh, at large. On a lighter note, I was actually surprised to when I was when I was listening to um, the Kenyan members of parliament. You know their comments. It was my first time to hear members of parliament of an African country really standing up as Africans and even saying it that we are Africans. We are Africans. We cannot take A B C D. This is an African. Whereas in almost all cases. They even forget to say that they are, they, are, they are Africans whenever any other thing which is economical gain for them comes through their parliament. I was actually listening to all of them and they were so proud of being Africans. They were so proud of pushing away this um, Western thing being imposed on us. But there are so many impositions which impoverish different people, but they will never say that as Africans, we don't take this. I really, I, really, I found that fascinating and I thought I should just share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much for that, Pumlani. And and just to remind everybody, the um, Eswatini Sexual and Gender Minorities Appeal case is on later this month. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's the 26th um, of April that the the appeal is going to be heard. So we we want to extend a lot of uh, good wishes towards the case and hope that the hearing goes well. Um, so we have we still have some time. So what I'm going to do is um, just to, to give you all um, a few minutes to um, share a further thoughts. So, and then I'm gonna pose a question. You don't necessarily need to respond to the question, um, but you may do so. Um, but if you'd rather give us some other insights into LGBTQI plus rights in your country, you're welcome to do so. So my question is in your view, why do some African courts appear to affirm LGBTQI plus rights in their rulings, yet NGOs advocating for these rights are still not permitted to register? It seems incongruent. It, it, it seems something is not quite right in that situation. Pumlani has given us a bit of a break, a breakdown of that in, 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 in the words that he's presented to us this afternoon. What does this indicate about potential for changing attitudes towards LGBTQI plus rights in Africa and in particularly in particular in Southern Africa and East Africa. Um, East Africa currently is a huge concern for all of us. They seem to be going to complete tangent on LGBT 
QI plus rights, which is deeply concerning, but can you just engage with us um, on your views? And with the responses, I suggest that we go in the order that you all presented. So to return back to Adrian to start. Adrian, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kajal. Um, well, it's a tough one, but uh, for me, I think there's a disconnect between um, between the courts on one hand, on one end, especially in countries that have progressed, and this is important, that litigation on its own in courts of It looks like Adrian's internet is, I think I've been giving him a bit of time. You could say he was having problems earlier. So maybe we could. I hope we get him back. So. Um, should we move, should we move on to Bradley mm -hmm. while we try to get Adrian back? Yeah, Bradley, if we can bring you in earlier. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, hang on. Here's Adrian. Adrian, are you okay to continue yes, with I your Wi-Fi? Okay. <laughs> I think it was my Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I was talking about the, the, the broader factors beyond the, beyond the courts of law that basically enforce the courts of law. And I was looking at democracy and rule of law and good governance, the extent to which the country actually um, is able to make decisions independent of the general population or independent of the dominant party in the country is important. And the example I would basically give um, is Botswana. <laughs> <laughs> but one other judgment that the courts gave, uh, you could you could see it's not big, it's not also a big, big departure from the community and the community's perspectives, but it is also at some point a big departure. Uh, if you remember the Kanene case before that, and then a few years later, there's a change in decision. This also change, shows the level of democracy they have in that country. The same thing with Kenya. The fact that Kenya can be that host, the population is streaming in that hostile, and then the courts of law are making an independent decision in terms of LGBT rights. If you look at the same courts when it came to nullifying an election petition, like that has never been done anywhere before. In you, I don't think it has, it has ever been done anywhere. It was done in Kenya. They nullified an election of a presidential election. I don't think that can ever happen in Uganda. So if you connect that judgment with a judgment in the, in the hereditary case, you see the real distinction. You, you see the real connection between this, the broader factors and the fact that democracy is also thriving in a country. So the Kenyans can shout and, and, and the parliament can do whatever it wants, but the courts of law seem to be with, with studying that kind of pressure. In Uganda, on the other hand, uh, the courts of law also seem to be a little more towing the line, towing the party line, like what the president wants is what they say. Even if we won in 2014, our victory was also partly because of political reasons. I cannot say that we won entirely because of our petition. We also won because of political factors. And the president, I think, had a big role to play in our petition succeeding. I think because we are left with their own devices, we wouldn't have won in that particular, in that particular decision, meaning that the courts of law may not be able to stand on their own and make a good judgment if the general rule of law in a country is terrible. So Uganda, the president is everything. That's why you get such judgment. So for me, it's also, we can't just talk about LGBT rights without speaking about the broader factors in the country. Democracy, good governance, rule of law are things we should really emphasize. So even as we call for LGBT rights and, and their protection, we should also call for protection of human rights generally, and also protection of democracy and rule of law and good governance across Africa. Because if we only improve in terms of LGBT rights, we are leaving a lot of other factors behind, and yet we all live in this same country and on this same continent. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adrian. Bradley, before we go to you, I see that Eric Gitari has joined us, which we are delighted about. So hello, Eric, and welcome. Um, Eric, if we can jump straight to you, and if you can give us some overview of, of uh, your recent victory in this Kenyan Supreme Court, and if you can give us some ideas also about how African NGOs advocating for LGBTQI plus rights can build on your recent victory um, to secure similar legal recognition in their countries where registration is denied and continues to be denied. Eric, over to you. Um. Good morning, or good afternoon, brother. Thank you very much, Kajal. Uh, apologies for joining late. I had a uh, crazy night with my writing. So uh, I will just make brief comments about the case in Kenya. 
Um, we started it 10 years ago on uh, the issue of reserving a name to be registered as an NGO. The main issue that the court framed for determination was whether sexual orientation is a protected ground from discrimination in the constitution. Uh, because the ground is not explicitly mentioned as the case in South Africa in, in the constitution. And so all the way from the High Court to the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court, uh, the three superior courts have been consistent that sexual orientation is included in the ground of sex uh, when it comes to the coverage of grounds for non-discrimination in the constitution. Um, that has of course been uh that has created a lot of backlash and pushback from the political and religious class currently we have the uh, the family protection bill which is seeking to reverse all those gains uh that the courts have made by parliament um how can lgbt movements in africa leverage on this case i believe in the migration of constitutional ideas and I believe that activists, litigants, and other people who are involved in the work of justice are carriers of, of this migration of constitutional ideas. So by use of comparative jurisprudence, uh, by use of uh, waves that movements are making within domestic settings, by studying state uh, behavior, especially by neighboring countries. I believe countries in Africa, such as those in um, uh, Namibia, can use this case to have their constitutions interpreted mm -hmm. further to include the ground of sexual orientation in the ground of sex in their constitutional mechanism of equality and non-discrimination, the grounds that are enlisted there because they are illustrative and not exhaustive. Uh, another way that movements can use this case is to generally um, advocate and engage in civic education using this case as a means of knowledge production uh, or, or knowledge generation on how um, a similar issue in different jurisdiction is being handled. If you compare the case in Kenya with the case in Nigeria, for example, the case of Pamela Adi, uh, which were almost similar and were stopped, registration was stopped at uh, almost the same level of reservation of names, and the names were found to be offensive by the administrative agency that was in charge of registration, then movements can see how they can circumvent such a hurdle by not only uh, using this knowledge for the public consumption, but the consumption of courts uh, through um, different forms of literature that we engage in as jurists to generate public education within the legal fraternity, including how we are training lawyers in our law schools, including how we are training lawyers in the continuous legal education uh, system to earn points for practice. So there are different methods and pathways of using this judgment uh, to increase the traction or to uplift the work of LGBT organizing in Africa. Um, in response to the last issue of what other rights needs to be addressed by LGBT movements across the continent, uh, I believe every right needs to be addressed. We can't just rest on the freedom of association and have it at there. We can't just have decriminalization and think that that will end all forms of discrimination. Uh, there are a lot there are a lot of rights that needs to be claimed because they have been constrained by the existing legal frameworks and existing social and political frameworks in our contexts so 
every right that is provided for in the Bill of Rights, and rights are not even enumerated, but do exist in international treaties and, and covenants, they need to be claimed and protected at the domestic uh, setting of every country. And this will be done by the local actors, uh, the people who are the right bearers through judicial mechanisms or sometimes through legislative mechanisms as we saw in Mozambique and Angola. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, even though it's very early your time at the moment. And um, so we were dealing with a wrap up from everybody and final comments. And uh, Bradley is next. So Bradley, if I can invite you. <clears throat> hey, um, I think from 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 me just to 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 add on also, and, and this is what Adrian had had spoken about earlier, also around the independence of the judiciary. I think it's important that that is 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 there um, because the courts really are there to to or have the duty to to promote protect um, the dignity or the freedoms. Um, and 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 rights that that we have. Um, so I think that's important. Um, I think, and I'm not sure how 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 we could um, 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 do it, but ensuring that um, when courts um, pass judgments, you know, it's from a human rights lens, um, and it ensures the the best interest of. Of the community, um, if it's the 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 the, the majority, even um, I think there is a need to to also look into um, the discourse between judgments that are passed and what is put into practice. Um, for example, I in in the ND case um, that happened in in Botswana in in 2017. Um, which was around legal gender recognition for trans individuals. Essentially, the the High Court did say that um, trans uh, transgender persons can change their um, uh, gender marker, uh, but in terms of practice, um, you know, if it's by the government, by by the state, that is not happening. Um, so now people have to keep going to 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 court and and go see court orders, which is very costly, also, especially for the LGBTQ people. Um, I think, yeah, there's that that need uh, um, to to ensure that that discourse that that happens um, is addressed. Um, yeah. Thanks, Bradley. Um, and Eric Sambisa, if we can move to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Kajal. Yeah, so I think uh, what we must do is uh, to change our narrative. Our narrative along the advocacy, I think for a long time, has been dwelled on HIV, which also translate how people have sex. I think that's a very long narrative uh, that uh, is, uh, is out there. I think we should have programs that uh, can actually uh, talk about recognition, uh, can talk about uh, um, access to security, uh, social exclusion, because these are the issues that the LGBTI community are continuously facing. So if we can change the narrative and uh, expose the vulnerabilities that the LGBTI community is facing, actually, we can change, because the public only think that we are only advocating for sexual rights, which is not the case. Yeah, so uh, I think we really need to have, uh, to design programs that can work around that. Um, our leaders always respond to international uh, obligation. They, they um, even the courts, they only uh, accept uh, to be, to be seen as good uh, leaders from that international platform, but the implementation of uh, whatever they signed 
or the whatever they signify at international platform does not really uh, uh, happen on the ground. So we really need to uh, change, to hold our leaders accountable so that whatever they put in paper should be implementing. And I think the international community has got that law of monitoring the implementation of all the treaties that our leaders ask, uh, uh, sign at uh, the international uh, community. Let us continue to choose our narrative carefully because as things are now, we are just talking about consensual sex Confessional sex, we are not talking about real issues, issues around violence, because I'm afraid issues that are happening in Uganda can actually happen to all of us, to all our countries, since our leaders, uh, they, they tend to copy what others are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric and Pumlani. We will give you the last word. All right, thanks, Kajal. And, um... Again, I was just um, going back to your question, which you, uh, when you asked uh, as to what 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 do we think is the reason behind courts um, ensuring and guaranteeing human rights of the LGBTI community, but then refusing them to have registered. I was just looking at the the the, the, the judgment which came from our High Court, and and there's a part where they, the, the the judge states that they have all the rights conferred by the Bill of Rights, they have a right to life, liberty, they have a right not to be discriminated, they have a right to associate and form companies, expression. Um, these rights are, however, subject to the laws. So that is what she stated. As to which law exactly is, is, is um, which law curtails um, the, these rights which she had guaranteed? She doesn't go on further to state that, but she states that all the rights are there. Everything she, they are free to go to hospital and everything, but subject to the law. So at the moment, the application is dismissed. Um, I hope that um, maybe um, the, to us, the, the, there'll be a better um, arguments on the case um, when it comes to the Supreme Court at the end of this month. And um, Looking at the way and the trend of uh, of, uh, of the trend and basically the attitude of our courts, it seems like we still have a lot to do, um, and we might need to strategize and come with the and, and in, in a united front of some sort, so that at least they may be held accountable for 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 accepting those um, international instruments, as Erica stated. There are some, so many other um, uh, regions on the international treaties which they have signed, and they had to comply with them after a certain pressure, United and sort of push and keep making sure that at least the leaders um, um, take serious their commitments which they have, they have done. And before the human rights um, committees and treaty bodies, the truth is, is shown because, yes, we do have um, shadow reports from non-governmental organizations, but these bodies as well seem to just keep recommending when they, the, the, the facts have been put forward by um, some reports from um, national human rights institutions as well of some of these things, some of the um, suffering which is undergone by the LGBTI communities in our societies. But you also find what they call in the Sadek region, a big brother kind of uh, treatment to um, issues which we are putting forward to them. I'm not really sure how much we can do to also sensitize them to take this issue seriously. I think though, um, that is all I can say for the moment. Thanks so much, Pumlani. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking the time um, to spend uh, this time with us to provide your overviews on your country situations in respect of social rights and in particular on the right uh, of association and the right to register organizations promoting LGBTIQ plus rights. Um, I want to wish you well in your advocacy and in the litigation cases which are coming up um, and going forward. And with that, I hand over back to Melissa. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kajal. And I'll also just say thanks again to our panelists for these very powerful interventions and very powerful messages to all of us today. I think it, it made for a very fruitful and very eye-opening conversation. Um, and um, I think that 
yeah, I think that we can, yeah, we can wrap up there. So um, ICJ will continue to advocate um, for LGBTI rights um, with our partners, and we look forward to be able to potentially partner with um, each and every single one of you going forward. I'll just stay, but um, as we look into the future as well. Thank you also to everybody who also joined this live stream. Um, we will make the recording available on our different social media platforms. So please follow us um, at ICJ Africa on our various platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, um, and also our global page on LinkedIn as well. Um, and if you have any questions at all or any require any further information about what we discussed today, please also feel free to send us a message and um, we will be able to get. Thank you so much and goodbye.